Good morning or afternoon everyone, wherever you are tuning in from. We're so excited to be presenting our webinar, Implementing a Fleet Crash Management Strategy. The webinar is brought to you by the National Road Safety Partnership Program, or NRSPP, in partnership with ARB Group and of course, City of Sydney. My name is Rosemary Patterson and I'll co-moderate this session and provide tech support if required. Jerome Carsnake, who manages the NRSPP, will be our primary moderator today. Welcome, Jerome. Welcome. Thank you, Rosemary. And there may be some people in our audience who might know about, might not know about the NRSPP and its purpose. Could you give them a short little bit of background? It would be my pleasure. Uh, for those who are unaware, the National Road Safety Partnership Program is an industry-led uh, collaborative program, all focusing on improving workplace road safety. It brings together governments, industry, uh, research groups, all focusing on key risks on how you can improve and do things in, that relate to workplace road safety. It's funded out of a range of government agencies and delivered out of ARB. And uh, yeah, so this case study, this story we have today is exactly what the program is all about. We develop a case study, we do a webinar, and we get everyone to have the chance to really say and ask the questions on the details. So I'm really looking forward to this one, and um, I know Len will do a fantastic job in leading us through it. Awesome. Thank you, Jerome. And we'd like to make our audience aware that, as always, we are recording today's session and we'll be sure to share the footage with you on conclusion of the webinar. Webinars work best when they're interactive, so please type the questions into the chat box and we'll address them along the way. Our presenters today are from City of Sydney. We have Len Woodman and David Gell. From 1976, Len has been involved in driver training ranging from heavy military vehicles to commercial driving instruction and he has spent over 20 years as a road safety professional. Len has delivered 10 submissions to Stay Safe as well as implementing 50 road safety programs. Len would say that he's learnt a heap through his extensive travel throughout Europe, Asia and Africa. Welcome Len. Thank you. And David, uh, David Gell previously worked as a senior associate with Carney's Lawyers and joined the City of Sydney in 2012 as Parking Services Manager. The role involves managing a team of eight and overseeing service and procurement contracts for the City's Parking Services Unit. David is currently leading a project to investigate and implement a ticketless on-street parking solution for the City of Sydney. And so we welcome David. And Len, over to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, morning, evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from wherever you are around the country and possibly overseas. Uh, so the City of Sydney Fleet Services uh, uh, implementing crash management strategy. Uh, the crash management strategy, the objective of, uh, of which is to implement strategies that promote a zero crash culture uh, from senior management right the way through to those that uh, drive and operate our vehicles and machinery. Uh, we also use it to support and improve driver skills, behaviours and awareness through driver development and coaching programs. The, um, I, also the key element in it is to promote pride in driving professionally, then people will do that, uh, that job well. And to address the key, key causes and contributing factors that result in vehicle crashes and to guide our business units with strategies and processes that minimise the vehicle crashes. You'll notice in the background there's also an eco-driving strategy, which is another document uh, that really goes hand in hand with the crash management strategy. Uh, as you, many of you may be aware, the City of Sydney is very much up in front and leading with regards to caring for the environment. So we have to balance two things. That is ensuring that we've got a fleet that is safe and a fleet that is environmentally friendly. Uh, why have we got a city fleet? Uh, many people sort of talk to me and say, oh, the city of Sydney, you've, you know, you're really um, up there with regards to uh, improving the environment, so why have you got vehicles on the road? Well, the city of Sydney, like any local government, has to provide local government services to residents, businesses, workers and visitors. In the city of Sydney, that uh, is around about on a busy summer's day, uh, around about a million uh, people visiting the city area. And if uh, anything to go by this morning, there were two cruise liners in the uh, harbour, so that could be another 5,000 people visiting central Sydney. So these numbers do swell and uh, sometimes they go down a little bit, but generally 
particularly this time of the year, coming up to New Year's Eve, um, there's a lot of people coming to see Sydney. So that works out around about 7,000 people per square kilometre and we're providing all different services for these vehicles. If we look at the number of roads that we've got, the amount of roads, that's about 330 kilometres of roads that we've got to look after. And we've got to travel through most of our buildings, of course, are adjacent to roads and uh, we need to provide those services that are specifically there for people. And it's some of the services we do, gardens to keep with so much dense um, inner city living, there's numerous gardens and parks that we have to maintain and keep to a high standard. People wishing to live in the inner city need places to go out and to relax and we are, I believe, one of the leaders in making sure that the green space that we've got around is, is good for those people to go to and makes it worthwhile living in an inner, inner city environment. Of course, we've got roads to repair, signs to maintain, um, We've got buildings coming up everywhere, so buildings to be inspected, whether they're new ones or modifications. Uh, most important thing probably is garbage to collect with an increasing residential population. The garbage collection is becoming more and more intense, more and more demanding on us. And of course there's the trees to trim and to look after and to maintain um, so that we've got you know, a green and pleasant city as well as an active, vibrant city. We've got meals to deliver, so in our city we have, with all those that population, quite a few people who do need the service and the interaction with other people. We, we provide that with the meals on wheels service, and many volunteers, um, and of course they've got a difficult job going around from one building to another delivering meals and keeping in contact with some of the people that need some of our assistance. Streets to sweep, um, that's particularly difficult with some of the uh, narrow streets that we've got. And of course, there's places to go. So we still have, that have jobs to do and need to get from A to B to carry things and take things. Although generally, we recommend that um, if possible, people take alternative uh, forms of transport, active forms of transport. And you can see in the upper picture there, the uh, parks people have a number of bicycles with little trailers on or they have the long bike cargo bikes and they can take their equipment within reasonable distances from our depots. One of the advantages of having a relatively small area but with a high density of population. So where we can, we will use active forms of transport. And our general suggestion to people is when they go out, um, particularly with those driving cars, um, if they don't know where they can legally park at the end of their journey, they might want to think about taking, uh, going by bicycle or public transport or even walking. Our city is quite a small area. So we've got all these different things to do and um, we then face a number of risks by being active and being out and about. Um, our largest vehicles are 23 tonne garbage collection vehicles and our smallest are Mitsubishi Miev's electric vehicles. The city is leading, I believe, with one of the largest fleets of electric vehicles. So we have a, quite a, a, a range of Nissan Leaf and Mitsubishi Miev vehicles. Uh, they are charged up overnight and we use solar energy to, um, to offset that against the, um, the main grid. The fleet is allocated across the range. We have a number of different units. As you can see, their cleansing and waste by far have the largest number of vehicles. They're the ones who are out cleaning roads, picking up the garbage, um, making the city nice and clear. And they've got uh, one of the busiest times in the year to coming up soon, New Year's Eve. And you'll probably have seen in the, the newspaper how each year they can clear the streets overnight and have it the city back running normally within well within 24 hours of major events. So we've got the people that maintain the roads, the signage, the footpaths, street furniture, etc. They sort of, could have sort of come in secondly. And then the people who look after the gardens and parks, um, city greening and leisure. So we can see we've got quite a few vehicles, 343 in all, um, and they're out working those streets. So um, we've probably got round about um, I think something like 17 cars per square kilometer if or 17 vehicles per square kilometer if they're all out at any given time. So we've probably got the highest concentration of fleet vehicles in, uh, in the city area. The only ones that might be greater than that might be Sydney buses during peak times. So with greater uh, activities, there's always a potential for road-related trauma. Um, also, 
with so many vehicles out, there's a, obviously greater expenditure. Uh, we're responsible for public funds and we don't uh, look at things with regards to what the bottom line is. Uh, we look to things as how we are providing a service for the public, um, all those people that I mentioned earlier, and do that efficiently and safely. So there is a cost involved if we have any incidents. That does cost us money. It also costs us time off uh, the road. And if we have specialized vehicles for a specialized um, particular job, if they're not available, then we have to find alternate means of, of completing those jobs to maintain our services. Um, some of the things that we do look at is, when, particularly in the driver development side, whilst this all costs money, we learn from each incident and try to prevent it happening again through effective coaching, counselling and, tra and, uh, and training, then hopefully we do get a little bit of return from our investment. Um, but some of the incidents, as you see there, can probably be um, avoided by more awareness. And that's the whole objective of the crash management strategy. Um, finally, one of the risks that we have is our reputation. We set examples when we're out driving around, so anybody that sees us driving our vehicles will um, quite often be looking at us to uh, see what we do, whether we do something wrong. Um, and if there's something that they believe we've done something wrong, of course, complaints will come in. Thankfully, not very many. Um, also, we set a, a reputation and we set examples with regards to road safety, so particularly speed and appropriate speed for conditions and obeying traffic signs and all that. It's all a very important part of our day-to-day -day, um, training and uh, assessment with drivers. At this stage, is there anyone like to ask me any questions relating uh, to those uh, first few slides? Thanks, though, Len. And if anyone has questions, please feel free to uh, shoot them on through to us and we'll happily ask them of Len. So I guess this is the first question here for you, Len. How do you actually go about protecting, obviously the City of Sydney's got such a strong brand as an organisation. How do you set about um, making sure that people don't take advantage of that and try and lay blame where it may not be allocated to? Yeah, that's a good one. That does happen, um, particularly with um, parked vehicles that get damaged. Um, they're very, some people are very quick to say, oh, it must be the garbage trucks going past. We do investigate everything um, that comes uh, to us. Uh, it, it, any complaints come to our central customer service area and it's logged. Uh, we follow up through each of the units to find out whether vehicles were in a location. Um, and we will investigate. Even if necessary, I'll go out and uh, inspect the damage to vehicles and see if that actually measures up to whether it could be one of our vehicles involved. That's a typical one. Um, there will be some people that, uh, let's say, they might have been upset because one of our rangers might have given them a parking ticket a couple of days beforehand. So they'll be there very, very uh, much looking at anybody that's got City of Sydney over the side. But generally, um, drivers um, are well aware of the fact that they once they're out in a vehicle with City of Sydney on the side are ambassadors of the city and we have, do have very, very few uh, comebacks or complaints relating to the behaviour and to whether they keep to the rules or not. Great, thanks Len. We've got some questions that are starting to come through and look Len, if I ask you a couple and, and they're going to be addressed later in your presentation, please feel yep. free to look, um, make, make that sort of reference. Um, so the first one here we've got from Karen, uh, what is the process with dealing with driver infringements, particularly speeding? Okay, with driver infringements, if uh, anyone that uh, has an infringement notice has to report it to us. If they found not to report it to us, then it's contravening their code of conduct. When we get um, any uh, photographic evidence, for example, speed cameras and uh, safety cameras, uh, popping up at most locations now, most intersections around the city. Uh, obviously, we find out who the vehicle has been signed out to at that given time, and we will get their details, obviously pass that on to the State Deco uh, Debt Recovery Office. The person will also be, um, we will talk with them and their uh, team leader or manager to find out exactly what happened on the situ that situation, why it occurred, and how they're going to prevent it happening in the future. So now I guess the next question after that, the yeah. building on that, is what happens if I get a repeat one or a third one? Repeat offenders can end up with them being taken off driving. And if the driving is 
um, part of their core role, then it can obviously affect them with regards to pay um, and with their position. So once we get repeat offenders, and it's quite rare, um, then it would be an issue to take up with um, our uh, workforce uh, services, to, and if necessary, to discuss the program of training. Um, there's a, a thing that I'll come up to later in the, this presentation about what we call returning drivers, drivers that have been off the road for any reason because of a, a number of incidents or a um, number of offences and when they've sort of done their time um, not, uh, not, being, not, not driving, um, we obviously during that period of time will um, be retraining them or mentoring them. All right, thanks Lynn. And we've got a question here from Tom. Can you speak to street maintenance, paving for example and bridge rehab? Is the city responsible for such upkeep? Sorry? Uh, can, yeah. you speak to, can you speak to street maintenance, paving for example and bridge rehab? Is the city responsible for such upkeep as well? The, there are areas where the city is responsible through our um, construction uh, people. If, uh, if you think about what we do and what the role of the uh, crash management strategy is, um, we are actually also uh, implementing the safe system approach to road safety, so safer drivers, safer vehicles and safer roads. Now, if we notice any, any of our drivers notice any issues with the roads, particularly potholes, damage to the roads, um, issues at the intersections. Uh, for example, we will pass that information back to um, our traffic management people and if it's something that's within our area that we're responsible for uh, as a local road, that will be dealt with. If it's something to do with the RMS on one of the main roads, then information will be passed on to the RMS and uh, hopefully followed up to make sure that uh, things are rectified. And of course, if we've got drivers you know, using the same roads regularly, if there is an issue and it's not uh, corrected, they will get back to us and provide feedback. Excellent. And just we've got one last question here before we uh, get you to move on. And uh, it's from Stuart. Can you describe to the listeners how the council's relationship with the workforce union is and when it comes to taking action against a union member and driver who is considered to have done the wrong thing? Uh, not had any problems with that at all. Um, we meet with the unions and um, regularly. Uh, the meetings that we have, particularly in the busiest section, cleansing and waste, uh, we have a meeting once a month. Um, with team leaders, union reps, and a member of the uh, the union, um, we don't haven't had any problem with the unions at all. That's a great great to hear, Len. Yes, um, what we do, I do talk to the union rep, and um, in fact, quite often the uh, the key union reps will come to me if there is a perceived issue with a driver, um, and we get it sorted out in conjunction uh, with the workforce uh, services, the unions and myself. How do you achieve that relationship, Len? Any, any words of wisdom? Um, I suppose it's just getting to know people and talking about it and being sensible about it. The key thing is that very much the same as uh, workplace health and safety. Um, the motor vehicles are a place of work for them and we all want to remain safe. So if we have someone that is perhaps not keeping up to the standards, uh, it's in everybody's benefit and anybody, everybody's interest uh, to ensure that something is done about it. Thanks, Len. All yours. Okay, let's carry on. So why are we at risk? Well, the, with the number of uh, people increasing in the city, there's greater demands. I mentioned before we need um, more park spaces for people that live in, uh, uh, in a city um, close uh, dwellings. Um, we have an exposure to difficult situations, and I'll show you some slides on that in a few minutes. Um, there's expectations by the public. There's the expectations that we keep all the things that we're responsible for up to a high standard, and that nowadays is relating to having even more and more complex equipment in order to do the job because uh, we find that new, new buildings come out, we've got to have vehicles that can get into underground basements to collect to rubbish or to go and get work done. So all these things um, all add to the risk and it's quite important that we have 
a, uh, an awareness program and management program that controls all this so that we've got people that are well trained and able to use that equipment and also don't get uh, suffering from stress because of the greater demands on them. Uh, the City of Sydney, I believe, is uh, some people from other states might disagree. Anyone from overseas will probably say that uh, traffic in some other major cities is worse. But in the City of Sydney, we probably have the most difficult traffic conditions in Australia. Uh, lots of traffic, lots of congestion. And all of our uh, drivers have to drive through these conditions in order to do their job. And it's very important that um, they, again, do that in safety but the conditions are really difficult. Even the back streets that all seem nice and open and very very, few, very little traffic, um, part of the uh, benefits of the city is that people do make their laneways much more attractive and much nicer. That can sometimes give us a little bit of difficulty when we've got work to do in those roads and laneways. So you can imagine uh, getting some of our uh, vehicles through some of these streets is quite difficult, as you can see here. Um, our heavy vehicle drivers are, I would say, particularly skilled in getting through some of these uh, laneways, and we get very, very few uh, incidents now. There's been quite a dramatic reduction in the last two to th two and a half, three years. Even though they're going through these difficult conditions, um, we can, in some places, use smaller vehicles. But we've got to weigh up the fact that if we use smaller vehicles, we've probably got to do more trips. That means more exposure to risk. Uh, and sometimes the, uh, the efficiencies of coming down to smaller vehicles is just really very uh, difficult to actually uh, achieve a, a good standard if we do so. So, for example, though, we can sometimes have situations where a team leader might have to go out in a ute to get down a laneway to pick up some garbage bins because not even our smallish gar garbage uh, collection vehicles can fit down there. And one of the things that you can see from here, as we get bigger vehicles, people buying uh, larger uh, four-wheel drive vehicles, it does tend to cause us a bit more problem. And we can't reduce the size of our vehicle even more because we take even uh, less uh, rubbish or uh, equipment around. Um, so that's just, sorry, I've just gone on to another question. So if we want to, <laughs> anyone want to catch up here for some that we missed earlier? So how did you get those, like, the, the, the laneway those drivers have to go down is incredibly yep. small. Yep. So what's the level of training? How, how long does it take to get a driver to that standard? Uh, okay, well, all of them have got to have the appropriate li uh, state license for the vehicle. Um, in most cases, we get them trained up to uh, heavy rigid vehicles. We don't have any combinations nowadays. Um, they will go out for up to two weeks with a specific trainer, um, an advisor who uh, works with them, particularly with the equipment, uh, the compression uh, cycles on the back, etc. Uh, a lot of that time is them getting practice. They are already qualified drivers, so we don't have learners going through there. They will go with and, and be guided by like a, a mentor for a short period of time, uh, as I say, up to two weeks. And then I will go out and assess them on their day-to-day -day work, uh, watching how they interact with other drivers, how they use their equipment, as well as drive the motor vehicle. Please. And I've got a good question here from Frank. He's asking about, are these, these units, they function, as, as, I guess, as team units? Um, how do you sort of develop that sort of camaraderie, if so? Getting out and about. Um, we're going through a program at the moment now every, and we'll see that in a slide that comes up, um, that we assess or evaluate every driver once every three years. We also have um, up to four to six times a year with the, uh, through toolbox talks with doing a presentation and other toolbox talks I also attend to talk with them about how things are going generally with their driving, um, crash statistics, uh, and also any particular things that come up earlier this year with the new rules of giving one meter to cyclists. Every unit was talked to with regards to their obligations, the new rules and scenarios and how to deal with it. Right. So it's getting out, talking with people. Um, people ha do tend to know me. I think Joe, uh, a few weeks ago when we had the, our insurers here videoing um, some of our drivers driving around and everyone as they came past was saying, oh, hi Len, hello Len, and one of the uh, film crew said, oh, 
is there anybody that you don't know? And that's the key thing, getting out and about. Good job. And give you give you a bit of an idea of the uh, international people dialing in. We have a good great another question here from Tom. Uh, yep. Rubbish collection in New York City occurs at night due to daytime travel demand. Is it similar in Sydney's city call? Okay, well, we do a certain amount of garbage collection and street sweeping at night, but tends to be in the more industrial areas and around uh, shop areas because we do have quite a lot of um, residents and the noise can be uh, quite restrictive. So we do a mixture throughout the night. We also have early starts and try to get it out of the way in the morning. Um, we have um, more or less a 24-hour operation, three shifts. Uh, so that's 2 to 10, 10 to 6, and 6 to 2. Uh, they do various different types of garbage collection. There's also specific demands uh, that happen from time to time from different, uh, different people, different uh, residents. Uh, someone may have left a couple of mattresses out in the corner. We don't want that to sit there all day, so we'll send a small vehicle out, response truck, to go and collect it and get that cleared out the way. So we work through 24 hours, but we do vary it depending on the demands of the specific locality with regards to consideration for the res residents. I think it really shows the, the pride that you guys have in looking after your city. We don't. So, Len, would you like to continue, please? Yeah, certainly. Okay, so the crash management strategy in itself, what it's all about. Uh, the first thing is it provides us with a range of tools to affect long-lasting attitudinal changes. Now, we talk about attitudinal changes. I don't, haven't put the word behavior. We can change behavior by bringing rules in. People will behave if there are rules in. People stop at red lights because there's a rule that says it. Um, they, the attitudinal changes is, comes to where they actually decide and want to do the, the change, want to drive in a specific way. And one of the reasons I've been out recently with a lot of our really heavy uh, vehicles um, is that we've got very professional drivers there and I need to be supportive of them and respectful of their skills and their abilities and to develop a professional approach so that they feel that they are doing a good job, they are skilled and, um, and, and set an example to others. It also provides an action plan to track our progress. So as you can see, it's 2015 to 2017. So early next year, David Gall and I will be looking at this crash management strategy, looking at what we've achieved, looking at what we need to probably focus on for the next following two years, see where there's anything we can change for the better and take anything out that's superfluous and not really been effective. Um, so those action plans are important to, tra to track the progress through the complete uh, period of time of the strategy. What do we want to achieve? We want to achieve a safe system for fleet driving that promotes a zero crash culture through safer people, safer vehicles and safer roads. So you can see that that is related to the universally adopted safe system approach to road safety. We talk about zero crash culture. Um, you probably, or any of the professionals there, will know about Vision Zero, um, and everybody is very keen on getting the, the, the Swedish approach to uh, saying, well, no one should be penalised through death or serious injury because they made a mistake on the roads. Promoting a zero crash culture is only slightly different in that we want to totally reduce the costs of even minor incidents and also demonstrate that uh, a minor incident one day could be um, a major incident the next day, so learning from whatever mistakes people make. Uh, when I first started doing this, uh, two and a half, three years ago, people were saying, oh, going out in all those conditions, it's inevitable that we're going to have a crash. Um, I've turned that around and said, well, you know, we've reduced the number of crashes dramatically. If it was inevitable that we were going to crash, we wouldn't get that reduction. Uh, so we've just got a little bit more work to do to keep it going down and down, um, just as uh, we do in, in, in the general road safety um, sphere uh, across the state and nationally. The other thing that we do look at is that we make it very clear to people that regardless of their job, as soon as they take control of a City of Sydney vehicle, in the eyes of the customers, to everybody out there that we've got to provide services for this, we're seen as professional drivers. They won't look at someone driving a car and go, oh, there's a planner there, or oh, there's a health inspector there. They look at someone in our vehicle and say, oh, you know, they're driving for an organisation, that must be their job. 
Same with the garbage collectors, they're professional drivers, they probably are more professional in that they are out on the road for six hours a day compared to some of the uh, smaller vehicles that people might only be out for an hour or so. So we are expected and must display an exemplary standard. No one can be perfect but we do strive to um, get to the highest standard as possible and the key thing that is seen on that is that people um, know that we've got City of Sydney on the vehicles and that the vehicles have to be driven around and shown in a good light. Now I come on to something, accident, the question mark. I think one of the biggest effects that I've had, and it really only came to me when we were practicing this webinar last week, uh, I have gone away from talking about accidents. Any professionals out there in road safety will know that crashes, collisions, incidents, a more appropriate term. Accidents, they imply no one's at fault, just happened, couldn't have done anything about it. A crash says something, someone has made a mistake, either they've done something wrong or they've forgotten to do something, very rarely is it deliberate, but a crash occurs because of a set of circumstances, most of which could be controlled. So one of the key things that I think has made a change is constantly talking about the difference between accidents and crashes we talk about crash reports, not accident reports anymore. We talk about incidents as opposed to near misses, etc., etc. So just by changing the word over the last few years and people getting used to it and constantly refreshing their memory on it, every time someone says accident, I actually correct them and say crash. Um, it does have a mental effect of saying, well, I can do something about it, even if it's not my fault. So whenever an incident occurs and people are talked with afterwards, interviewed, um, we talk about how it could have been avoided, um, what, could have, what situations arose. So even if it's someone else's fault, we talk about what could we do to have prevented that incident from actually happening. Next set of questions, please. Certainly. So <clears throat> we've got one here from Stuart. What exists in the city of Sydney for there to be an inclusive collaboration between councils, driver education, et cetera, road planning sections, departments, are they working in groups that look at common goals for the safe systems approach? Yes, well, the City of Sydney has uh, a number of teams, really. We have, uh, let's take my side, fleet services aside. Uh, we have our own road safety officer, which uh, was a position I was in for 19 years before I took uh, this role up. So we have a road, two, two road safety officers that work on the education and promotion of uh, road safety generally throughout the city covering everything from schools and kindergartens right the way through to low risk driving. Um, they also provide a certain amount of uh, assistance with new drivers, uh, but a lot of it is promotional uh, material relating to the issues of road safety, particularly in the city of Sydney, pedestrian and, and uh, cyclist safety. We have a cycling development team that has been active for some 10 years. Again, I was part of that until I started with Fleet Services. Uh, their role is to improve cycling facilities by putting in cycleways and um, awareness programs for cyclists. And I know that team gets out uh, several times a week talking to cyclists about how uh, to ride and move around safely in the city. We have our traffic management team of professional uh, traffic engineers who are there to um, deal with all new road environments um, and maintaining the old system. And then of course we've got the people at the end, the construction people um, that get out there and do implement all the work. We all um, work together. That, that's excellent to hear. So uh, if you wanted to be a, an employee in cycle, uh, sorry, if I was an employee for the City of Sydney, I wanted to cycle, can I just get on the bike and, and take off and do that? No, you can't because we really appreciate that there are some there's different ways of riding a bicycle. I'm a cyclist um, generally as well as driving. I mix it all up, uh, different vehicles, different uh, bicycles. Now, we do have a fleet of bicycles as you saw in that photograph. We've got uh, people out in parks going out and uh, doing work on, on bicycles. We've got people who are going to do inspections on bicycles. Before um, anyone can use our fleet, bicycles, um, they have to do a half day training course which is run by an organisation called BikeWise, I hope that doesn't sound as though I'm promoting them, but uh, they uh, have professionals in that have uh, the skills are developed in the UK where there's been 
uh, a lot of um, emphasis on cycle training over the last well, 30 years. Uh, the bike wise have also got experienced operators that have spent time in the Netherlands, the place where cycling is, uh, is the biggest thing out. Um, they have provided a very effective course, both for the public, for children, but also for our staff. So any of our staff doing, uh, one wishing to ride a bike for work purposes, uh, they, they do a half day riding course. Now I'm also promoting that, funny enough, because I believe that if someone, even if they only ride the bicycle for the cycling course, they really do get an insight of what it's like to be a vulnerable road user and uh, that really gives them a lot of good information um, and makes them more aware of uh, vulnerable road users when they're driving motor vehicles, particularly the trucks. All right, thanks, Lynn. And we actually have a great webinar we do with Amy Gillett Foundation, if people want to yes. be directed to that. So um, I'll, I'll combine two questions now from Karen and Peter. Um, is the crash management documents available online for us to view? And the I believe, Jerome, that you've got it on your, uh, in your library. We do. So it's linked to the case study, Karen. Um, and the uh, other one is... Yep. And the there's also, management. don't forget, the low-risk and eco-driving handbook. Oh, there is indeed. We'll be touching on that all in a tick, I believe. Yep. Um, the other question, the crash management strategy and the eco-driving strategy go hand in hand. Why? Ah, if, if anybody that's really looked into driver training and driver behavior will find that generally someone who drives smoothly, comfortably for the passengers, um, is aware of their surroundings, drives in a way that they prepare themselves using observation, anticipation, and giving themselves time to react and other people time to react, they tend to do it in a way that is eco-friendly. Um, being gentle on the gas pedal, being gentle on the brakes, and using a vehicle to get from A to B safely and efficiently, um, rather than as a, a symbol of charging around, and sometimes we see people just thinking they can make progress by going at high speeds, getting stopped at traffic lights, held up in traffic lanes. Um, it's a, it's a, the, answer, the, the full answer to that could be quite lengthy, but basically the two go hand in hand. Smooth, comfortable driving tends to relate to less use of fuel. Less use of fuel means that the, um, the environment is, is protected a little bit. Right. Um, question here from Tom. Can you give us an idea of how folks, um, you know, what, what you're speaking about, and how many City of Sydney employees routinely, routinely perform their work duties requiring travel? Well, we have uh, roughly 1,900 staff. Um, we have about 1,200 of those. Um, our authorised drivers, around about 600 would be 600, 700 would be routinely using motor vehicles. So that would be in our garbage and waste services, our construction services, people moving uh, plant around. Um, we've got the rangers, a certain number of those are out in motor vehicles where they can't walk or ride around. Uh, then we have a number of other staff that need a motor vehicle to pick up things such as um, those that work in the parking meter services, they may have to go and pick up parking meters and the equipment relating to that. Um, so they need to be out and about in the vehicles. So around about 700 people are driving on a regular basis. Probably another 300 are driving probably three to four times a week for periods up to two hours. Excellent. So they um, actually, oh, sorry. Just want to add on to that. And then we can move on if that's right, Len. Okay, and we move on? Yep. Okay. Tools and strategies, the way ahead in the crash management strategy. Um, the biggest tool that we've got at the moment is the low risk and eco driving handbook, which um, was worked on and uh, released in September. And um, it's going out to every person who drives. It's also linked in with a, uh, an initial training session to tell people what it's all about, why they need to use it, and how they can use it. It was actually, uh, or is a uh, development of the 2007 version called the Safe Driving Handbook, which was um, put together by uh, SS Rock, the Southern uh, uh, Region of Councils. So there was a number of councils got together and put the Safe Driving Handbook together. In 2007, we decided that it did need development and also 
need to cover eco driving uh, as well as low risk driving which is a better terminology than safe driving driving in a low risk way um, prevents not just causing crashes but being involved in crashes so that's our key tool at the moment and it goes hand in hand with presentations that are gradually getting through the 1200 drivers that we have Operational guidance, we have a fleet management strategy and a motor vehicle policy and procedure documents. They set out what vehicles we buy, why we buy them, and looking for what is required of a new vehicle. Uh, the procedure is how they're used and what people are allowed to do with their vehicles. They link in closely with the fleet management strategy and that also links with the uh, crash management strategy and the eco-driving strategy. Now, we do have a lot of strategies and various things. We will be looking at bringing some of these together uh, next year and seeing if we can uh, amalgamate a few of these uh, documents to make it a much easier bundle of, uh, uh, of equipment uh, available to us. Maintaining standards, looking at low risk eco driving and not just in the classroom but getting out and uh, as I said assessing people um, on a three yearly basis and you'll see why in a minute. Using the safe system approach so that people learn, all our drivers learn about the safe system, learn about the three elements, the drivers, the vehicles and the roads. License upgrades, whilst we do get people come in to various units um, and they need a high grade license for heavy vehicles, particularly or buses, and whilst we get some that are already licensed, those that come in and work through the process uh, do get the opportunity to go and get trained for a higher level of license. As we said before, They'll go out and get their license, particularly uh, heavy rigid, and then come back and have some, uh, gain some experience with a mentor for a period of time going around the difficult city environments we have. The returning driver procedure, we talked about what happens if someone is a recidivist offender. If they, uh, if they uh, commit a number of offenses or they have a number of incidents, we will start to look at the process. So we do analyze their crash report from the person that's involved, look at who's at fault, work out what we need to do, uh, look at all the different elements um, and decide whether driver coaching is required, uh, we decide what is needed to get them back on the road. Now we do value our drivers and thankfully we don't have too many um, repeat offenders because we get into a lot of this quite early now. Um, because if we've got someone who we've had trained and has the skills to get through all those little laneways and drive around, um, we really want them to be driving, but they've got to be driving safely. So we put every effort we can into it. We also sometimes we look at their behaviour and suggest that they have counselling, um, which is available through the workplace, to see if that can assist them, because quite often, um, if someone has an issue with their driving, it may not be that so the driving itself is the problem. It may be external pressures. It may be home life. It may be uh, anything from depression to uh, other issues that is affecting their driving standard. And we will look at that and, wherever possible, give as much assistance and help to our staff to get, keep them driving where they're of value to us. I said before that we talked about um, assessing people's driving every three years. That's come from our insurers. We have uh, Lumley, our insurers, um, have got a very good manual, which I've taken bits out of um, for safe fleet operations. And the, one of the best comments they've got in that is experience has shown drivers only need in-vehicle driver training about every three to four years if regular in-house training is provided through toolbox talks and presentations. And for example, the, the implementation of the low risk and eco driving handbook. Um, so that's really looking at, uh, many of you that have been in road safety for many years will know the Swedish telecom uh, exercise that was done in the 90s where they got three large groups of people. One group received advanced driver training, one received in-house um, talking sessions in small groups um, and there was obviously a control group and they found that the ones that succeeded mostly were those people that sat down and talked about their driving experiences and talked about being aware of what they do when they go out. And it also comes back to good driving reduces the chances of causing a crash. There are many good drivers out there, contrary to a lot of people saying, oh look, at you know, it's, it's, an, it's a, a jungle out there. Many people drive well 
and that reduces the chance of causing a crash, but low risk driving increases the chance of avoiding a crash regardless of who was at fault. We've got a number of checks and balances through the crash management strategy. Of course, driving license, drivers are licensed checks from new beginners who to join us. Uh, they have to go through an authorization procedure and we check off their driving license, make sure it's valid. They have to sign to say that it's uh, still a valid license and that um, that, it, that they uh, have the appropriate licenses. We simply need to see that um, before we take them out and let them drive our vehicles. New drivers, particularly in the heavy fleet, um, there's an induction process and their driving competencies assessed. The driver competencies, we base that on standard training, but based on training.gov.au guidelines. And if you look up anybody that isn't aware of training.gov.au, please look it up. The guidelines of competencies they have is enormous from everything from uh, driving cars um, to eco-driving to forklift trucks and uh, B-doubles if necessary. So the competencies are all there. That's the general expectations of the uh, national government on us as drivers and plant operators. Training, keeping up to date. So again, through the workplace training, we're starting on a series of video clips on how to do things. That's been uh, quite an interesting um, comment or request from a number of the presentations that I've done. If we can have short video clips on our internet, intranet internally, people can look up things at specific locations and um, get uh, advice on how to handle certain driving situations. So I'm going out regularly now in motor vehicles with an in in inside camera and video and clips. We've done one recently on how to pass a cyclist, uh, which will be available uh, probably to, uh, to, to you, Jerome, soon, um, because it'll be put onto to your website. So working with others, the question I had before is, um, uh, do we work together with other units? Well, the answer, as I said before, yes, we've got all different units that we work with, not just for the driver education or driver awareness, but also uh, for the services they can help us providing a safer roads, a safer environment. Our city net, we have an internal, what we call city net, that's our in-house online line training and we're developing programs for that. Each member of staff at the City of Sydney, like probably most other organisations, has a performance review each year um, with a six-month uh, sort of uh, uh, assessment uh, halfway through the year. Um, we are including now the driving ability and driving skills as part of the performance reviews. Measurement and benchmarking. Um, one of the things I'm going to say about the National Road Safety Partnership Program is it has provided a wealth of information. I used to have to, I think they call it, troll through the websites to try and find information for what other people are doing um, to see what I can copy and, uh, and use to our advantage. Um, the website that Jerome's put together is just fantastic. There's everything there that anybody needs. Uh, sometimes the only thing is that you can spend all day reading through everything that, that's on there because it's so interesting. So that allows us also to compare against others. Uh, so I was particularly keen and excited in uh, working with Jerome's team in looking at the case study. They asked a lot of questions and uh, did a lot of research into what we're doing, followed up on things, looked at our crash data, um, all those sort of things were really, really good. Um, the crash data, when I worked as a road safety officer, we used to get the crash data every year, about a year behind, so it was difficult to actually work out where we'd done well and where we needed to, uh, to pick our game up on. We, through Lumleys, get crash data every month, and I can see on a monthly basis whether a particular unit has had some crashes or um, we've had to claim uh, for particular things. Uh, so we've constantly got that data which I can refer to, I can refer to the team leaders and managers and also to the individuals involved because they're all mentioned on it. So getting all this information is really important so we can see where we're going. It's very difficult to benchmark a, uh, an urban council though with the conditions and the variety of vehicles. So we couldn't really compare ourselves to say one of the large transport uh, uh, fleets. Uh, so we're looking for more local government organizations to join the uh, NRSPP um, so we can all compare ourselves and, and share information. Uh, 
Um, the crash claims, um, this is what we got the end of the last sort of insurance year, which finished last March, showed quite a dramatic improvement. Um, I think this is because we've come along and started to do something. I'm really hoping that we continue down that, but I think like a, a lot of us will, will know, it will start to taper off and then there's going to be probably more effort, effort required um, to maintain a downward uh, trend. It's going to get harder work as it gets lower and lower. Um, but presenting this information and the costs to our staff who drive makes them proud of the fact that they're uh, part of that and also there's a little bit of the fear factor that they don't want to be involved in serious crashes if they can help it because that could turn those, uh, those graphs up the other way uh, very quickly if we had any serious incidents. So it's putting a fair bit of responsibility onto the drivers but that's something that uh, is generally welcomed. So crashes by fault have also been dropping down. Um, one of the uh, things that we do, any organization suffers from is the single vehicle incidents and, and also being at fault. Again, that relates back to um, our risk with our reputation. Um, we're seeing the at fault crashes go down as quickly as the third party um, responsibility crashes. Um, I'd like to sort of try and make that disappear in the future if I could, but uh, that's a, a bit like looking at the uh, Vision Zero. Um, the city uh, takes the information, we look at the different types of um, crashes that uh, have been involved or we've been involved in to see if we can eradicate uh, some of the uh, situations and improve it in the future. Um, the other thing that we've got that's not shown on here is each individual unit, we can break down the numbers of crashes and talk to their managers and staff individually about making specific reductions by unit. One of the things that we do have, which is very strong, is support right the way from the top. We ha recently have a new director that covers our whole division, which is by far the largest with regards to motor vehicles. Uh, one of the first things he asked me when he met me was, when am I going to take him out for a driver assessment? David, who's sitting next to me and is the executive manager at the moment, um, was assessed some months ago, so uh, that went very well. So management right the way down, we've had a number, the, the manager of garbage services was the first of all his drivers to go out in a garbage truck, which he doesn't normally drive on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, he set an example there. We had the same in our construction services where the team leader and managers went out first and the uh, other staff uh, then obviously um, volunteered to come out soon after. So it's very important we've got those uh, hierarchy um, supporting us, but for anybody that uh, has had an experience in the military, um, it's all very well all the uh, senior staff uh, supporting. What's really key to it all is making sure that the team leaders, the, the first level of management supports it because if you, again, if you've had any military experience, you know it's the corporals and the lance corporals that run wars that do everything. And if they tell or request their uh, guys to do something, that will be done. So if we've got a team leader or just a junior manager as not agreeing with us, it will be a very negative effect. We've got to have them on side more than anybody else and follow right the way through to the hierarchy. So that more or less concludes my um, pre presentation, the crash management strategy. Perhaps I can come back and talk about the eco-driving strategy next year because I've enjoyed this, uh, talking with everybody. Um, as Jerome said, this is available. I'm going to just go on to the next questions and the final few questions if we can have that, Jerome. Awesome. We have a poll here. Thank you. Um, you talk about, and this one I really like from Karen, by the way, you talk about council drivers assessing an example. Have you had any feedback as to whether drivers take this example into their own environments, e.g. driving on holiday or to the shops? The drivers themselves in their own driving, we've had comments, and one of the things um, that uh, I do is I don't exclude from any of the presentations. In fact, I encourage managers to allow those that don't drive council vehicles that drive their own vehicles um, to come as, as part of that uh, session. Um, the reason being is that if we can perhaps prevent an incident occurring to even a member of staff at a weekend in their own vehicle, um, if, if for example they were involved in a crash and they 
can't front up for work, we've got a, obviously a staff issue. Um, so we really need to at least morally look after all of our staff, regardless of whether they drive for work or only just for themselves. Um, with regards to um, the uh, effect that our vehicles might have being driven around on others, about a year ago, I do have from my road safety officer days quite a few colleagues in the police and a comment was made to me um, by one of the police officers that oversees the crash management uh, centre who turned around and said, oh, you know, I've seen your guys driving around, they're driving, you know, very rarely are they, you know, doing anything wrong. He said, you know, we very rarely would ever, he said, I don't even know whether we've pulled any over, but uh, um, if they're travelling down the street, a 40k speed limit street, at no more than 40k, then all the people following have to. So there's the uh, sort of effect of um, uh, it being safer for others because we're setting the, the pace, which I think we're doing across the board and hopefully, hopefully we will find ways of keeping that going. All right, thanks then. Got a good question here from uh, Chris. What does the low risk driving handbook cover? What are the key topics? The key topics here in the low risk is looking at um, <coughs> The, um, the safe system approach to, uh, to road safety, um, looking at you as a driver, your responsibilities, and then there's a number of different uh, little um, bits of advice. Uh, recently, we, we did win an award from Lumley's, and one of the things is they looked at the low risk and eco driving handbook and said it wasn't a set of procedures or instructions, it was advice based on experienced drivers, and we did get that sort of feedback. Um, the, so there's everything in there compared, that relates to someone driving a City of Sydney vehicle, so responsibilities with regards to alcohol and drugs, responsibilities with regards to speed, responsibilities with regards to cyclists and other vulnerable road users, which are one of the most important things to us in the city. So the best thing might be is to download it and have a look. And you can, there's my details in it, so then anybody that wants to get back to me um, and talk about it, it'd be great. I'd love to hear from you. Excellent. Thanks, Len. Is there, um, this one's from Stuart, is there a City of Sydney strategy or plan for introducing fleet telematics in the near future? Sorry? Um, is there a City of Sydney strategy or plan for introducing fleet telematics into the future? Telematics, yes, we're looking at, uh, at bringing some of the uh, uh, initial parts of that in. Um, well, I've been looking at several that are available around the world. Uh, we've been discussing that. We will be bringing in uh, GPS systems for our vehicle, all our vehicles very soon, um, in the next uh, year or so, so, in the next budget. Um, we have to look at whether the what, what it's going to actually provide for us. Because we work in a very small area and um, we have short distances to travel, um, it may not be, we may not have the same requirements as, for example, a fleet that operates long distances, say trucks going from Sydney to, to Melbourne, Sydney to Brisbane and things like that. So there are a lot of uh, variations that we need to look at. We've had, uh, last year we had someone uh, come to us with uh, a package and it really didn't suit our sort of short stop start situations for example you know, garbage collection um, the vehicles are going short distances stopping short distances starting so um, we, we have to look at all that and make sure that the package covers what we want and it's going to be val of value to us so we haven't decided on anything yet but we are looking into it for the future Right, thank you. The last question, because I know we're just about out of time, and um, for those who haven't answered questions, we'll email them to Len and ask him to follow up. And just a personal note, Len, thank you very much for the kind words as well. Um, thank you very much, Jerome. So here we go. So here's a question from Karen. Uh, do the waste drivers have, have job and knock in the terms of this can have risk as drivers do the job quicker so they can knock off quicker? No, um, a lot of the, uh, that, that, that was the old fashioned sort of approach is uh, come in early, get you, do it by uh, run and off you go. Uh, now there, the expectation is to work the full day. 
Now that also does help in that those that have been doing runs before in short periods of time, there's, there's obviously an excess and that can cover some of the growth in population we've got. But the key thing is, and the overarching uh, uh, phrase is that you never should be in a rush. And when uh, drivers are spotted, perhaps driving um, in a rush, not necessarily even too fast, but uh, that we might uh, have to have a word with them. Wonderful. Thank you, Len. And just a quick FYI from uh, Tom over in, in the US. Keep an, eye on, keep an eye on the New York City Connected Vehicle Pilot Projects managed by New York City Department of Transport. There may be some interesting technology-based solutions produced there. So just an FYI. I actually through. saw something about that the other day. So yes, I'd be interested in looking at that. Awesome. Maybe I'll have a chat with Tom and we might be able to draw some information to a webinar for that. So thank you everyone today for, for being part of this and the fantastic questions. Over to you, Rose. Uh, just finish off. There's information and there's my details there. Awesome. Thank you, Len. Um, thank you to Jerome for fielding the questions and facilitating so well. And thank you to our uh, awesome audience. We'd like to know that you can give us some feedback, so please stay on the line and fill out uh, the survey that will help our webinars improve for the future. But Len, what a great webinar. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you.